Thank you all. So I'm going to walk you through some key facts and uh, thoughts about stroke. Uh, let's start off with who here would, would want to have a disabling stroke? <laughs> so <laughs> obviously, there was actually a, uh, an article in the American Journal of Cardiology in the mid-90s where a study was done of people, about 200 people, and asked that question, about 90% of people said they'd rather die. So avoiding a stroke is rather key. So I'm going to walk you through some key facts here. So first of all, stroke is incredibly common. But there are still a lot of people that have a stroke in the United States. It's a major cause, the major cause, of long-term disability in the United States. So stroke can kill you. It can leave you perhaps worse off than that in the sense of unable to do things for yourself. Um, stroke is avoidable, not 100%, but certainly compared to our previous teachings, stroke can be treated when it happens, but it's better not to have it. These are some of the key features that would let you know, hey, you know, um, my aunt or son or daughter or whatever may be having a stroke. Stroke is sudden, usually. Think about it, and I'll walk you through this. Stroke is usually due to a blood vessel blockage or less commonly a blood vessel that has broken, that is hemorrhaged. So Sudden onset, one-sided is pretty typical because of the wiring of the nervous system of the brain. And then depending on where in the brain it occurs, there are different sorts of symptoms. So you could have sudden numbness, you could have trouble with speaking, dizziness, confusion, sudden unexplained headaches. In my training as a resident here, trained at UCSD, we didn't have a lot of things that we could offer or talk about preventively. We actually would debate for a long time whether to give someone an aspirin to avoid a stroke because the data really wasn't that great. So now we have a lot of data. So I'm going to walk you through some of the high points about that. In terms of what to do if you come upon someone or you're concerned that you or a loved one may be having a stroke, this is a pretty simple algorithm that should tip you off, take action 911. Ask the person to smile, ask them to raise their hands, ask to speak a simple sentence like, the sky is clear and sunny in San Diego. Right? So that takes a little bit of articulation as well as the ability to string one word after another. And then timeliness is crucial. In one minute of stroke occurrence, we lose about a million brain cells. So it's not something to wait and see about what's going to happen. We don't say, hey, you know, why don't you go to bed and see if your arm wakes up in the morning. It's call 911. Don't put someone into the car. That's much slower than taking rapid action. Most stroke, as I mentioned a moment earlier, is due to a blocked blood vessel. We call that ischemic stroke, lack of blood flow. About 20% or so of strokes, 25% are bleeds. Those are where a blood vessel has ruptured, most commonly due to high blood pressure, but it can happen, for example, if there's malformed blood vessels, an arteriovenous malformation, a weak spot in a blood vessel, an aneurysm. And then when we look at ischemic strokes, blocked blood vessel strokes, you can see those break down into different sorts based on what is the cause of it. So in a general sense, it's a blocked blood vessel, but it could be a blocked blood vessel because one of the arteries in the neck, the carotid artery, has gotten very narrowed and is blocked off. Or that artery might be mostly blocked but dropping little bits of crud, of debris, that float downstream, block a narrower blood vessel. That's called an embolus. Or someone could have a heart rhythm problem like atrial fibrillation, and emboli can break free, lodge in the brain. That causes a stroke. That's an embolic stroke. Or it can be due to narrowing of the tiny blood vessels within the brain. Those are called lacunar strokes. Those occur in about 20% of stroke. And those are mostly caused by high blood pressure, diabetes. So you're going to kind of hear a theme of stroke risk factors. And ultimately, stroke prevention turns on managing the risk factors. This illustrates ischemic stroke both in terms of what happens. A blocked blood vessel, as you can see over there, has led to a big darkened area on this CT scan. And that darkened area is brain that's dead or dying, OK? So that's not going to grow back. We don't have stem cells that work for this yet. If someone's recovering from stroke, it's due to neuroplasticity, meaning other parts of the brain are substituting and working overtime to help out. But it's unlikely that that person's going to have a good recovery. In fact, more likely than, than not, that person's at risk of dying because of such a huge stroke. You can see it accounts for almost half of the brain a third of the brain on the left side on CT scans. White here is bone. White can also represent blood. And the left side of the brain is represented on the right side of the picture. This is a hemorrhage. Those are potentially even more dangerous, as you can see with the sliced brain there. That person obviously didn't survive. 
And that's the kind of hemorrhage we see if someone's blood pressure goes skyrocketing and bursts a little blood vessel. You can see these little tiny vessels here. Those are susceptible to blockage. That would be an ischemic stroke, a lacune, or rupture. And then you can see on the CAT scan there the whitish blob on the left side of the picture is hemorrhaging in the right side of the brain. And so that would typically cause paralysis, weakness, maybe severe headache, and because it's so large, unconsciousness. Has anyone ever heard TIA, or some people call them TIAs? Yeah, so TIA is the right way to pronounce it. It stands for transient ischemic attack. So in my training, TIA was a event, a neurologic event, a ischemic event that lasted less than a day. It turns out that that's not a very good definition because think about it. If I told you, as I did a moment ago, that every minute counts and that a minute translates into a million brain cells dying, well, we don't want to wait a day to see what's left, right? There's, there's damage. In fact, most true TIAs, transient ischemic attacks, clear within certainly less than an hour, and commonly in about 80% of them clear in less than 10 minutes, okay? So the definition of TIA has been, let's say, rewritten. It's an ischemic event. Focal neurologic means one part of the brain is not just, um, I'm tired, that's not a TIA typically less than an hour without evidence of infarction. So that means that if someone comes to the emergency department and they had an event that sounded like a TIA and the CT scan shows an area that looks like a stroke or an MRI shows an area that fits a new stroke, we would recategorize that as a stroke, not a TIA, even though you were fortunate enough to dodge the bullet and not have symptoms any longer. So it takes away most of the element of time. Um, if someone has an event that lasts three days and then goes away, that wasn't a TIA. That almost certainly was associated with damage, but it may be in a part of the brain that just by you and me talking, we can't really describe or see that, but with proper imaging, with MRI, we're almost certainly going to see signs of damage there. The relevance of TIAs is basically it's a warning shot across the bow. It's an indication of a high-risk scenario. It's one of the strongest predictors for stroke. Because essentially what it's saying is, you've got a problem with blood vessels, and this is your short-term warning that says, next time you may not get away from Dodge so easily. So this is a study that was done a while ago in Northern California Kaisers, where they looked at people who had been diagnosed with a TIA in the emergency department and then followed them over time to see what happened. So over there on the far side, you can see stroke. 10.5% had a stroke within three months and half of those strokes happened in the first two days. That tells you this is a important warning that a stroke is high risk. 10% is a high risk, right? Some of them went on to have additional TIAs. Some of them went on to have heart attacks. But in fact, the <coughs> biggest prediction of a TIA or stroke is more problems in that same territory in the brain. But because most TIAs, most strokes, relate to hardening of the arteries, atherosclerosis, if you have bad blood vessels here, you probably have some problems with blood vessels elsewhere. And so it's important also, if someone has a TIA or stroke, that the doctors look into, is there a cardiac issue that goes in hand in hand? The American Heart Association has put together a, uh, let's say, a prioritized list of treatable risk factors. And you can see there, high blood pressure is clearly the most important. Only about a quarter of people in the United States diagnosed or diagnosable with high blood pressure, over 140, over 90, are being treated. In fact, a large fraction of them aren't even diagnosed. They're seeing their doctor and the doctor says, it's not too bad, we're watching it, and that's not a good strategy. About half of stroke could be prevented if we had really good tight control over high blood pressure. And The question of what's good control is still open to some research and debate. I used to say as low as you can go if you're not fainting. That's not so great, right? Because if you faint, you could hit your head and that could be bad, or you could break a hip or a rib. But the goal in general would be to have a systolic, which is the higher number in the 125 to 135 range, lower if that's okay to you, and the diastolic in the 70 to 80, 85 is starting to creep up there a little bit. You can see some of the other major risk factors, that smoking roughly doubles the risk of stroke, but stopping smoking brings you down to the risk of a never smoker within a few years. I saw someone earlier today who I was asking her about her smoking history. It was kind of out of the context of 
this. She had had migraines. She was worried about visual distortions that she had had that were migraine related, not stroke related. And she said that she smoked for about a year when she was a teenager. She's now in her 40s. Whew. Don't pick it up again, right? Take it to heart. This actually matters a lot. Um, diabetes, common condition. Obviously, as our population gets heavier, there's more type 2 diabetes than there used to be. And that puts people at greater risk of stroke, especially with that little lacunar small blood vessel blockage kind of stroke that I mentioned earlier, but it also adds to atherosclerosis in the sense of hardening of the arteries and blockage of the carotids or the vertebrals. The blood vessels in the back of the brain are equally important. They're just not as frequently affected by stroke as the carotid arteries. High cholesterol is a risk factor, and atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heart rhythm that gets more common as people get older, and therefore we're seeing more and more of it as the population gets older, is a powerful risk factor for stroke and stroke in the context of atrial fibrillation, I'll walk you through in a couple of minutes, can be um, markedly reduced by use of the proper kinds of anticoagulants, blood thinners. So what this looks, like, looks at is the effort, or the result, I should say, of stopping smoking. You can see that of people who were smoking after several years, their risk gets back to that of a non-smoker within just a few years. So if you have friends and family that are still smoking, obviously there's nothing healthy that you can say about it, but you can say, hey, by the way, stroke is a terrible thing to have, and stopping smoking, though not easy, very, very important. I mentioned the high blood pressure link. Studies have shown that a 10 millimeter change in your systolic or diastolic blood pressure alters risk by about 30 percent. That means going from 150 to 140 reduces risk by 30 percent. Going from 150 to 160 raises the risk. So obviously, the goal is to have the lowest possible risk. No one wants to have a stroke. Anyone here on a statin, a cholesterol-type medicine? It's been pretty common. So um, we used to think about cholesterol as you know, kind of important only in plugging up blood vessels. But it turns out that having elevated cholesterol is a marker for inflammation in the body. So it's a pro-inflammatory state. And the statins all reduce inflammation, not in the sense of, for example, ibuprofen you might take for a sore shoulder, but they reduce vascular inflammation. Inflammation of the lining of the blood vessels leads to a greater chance of hardening of the arteries. And so the statins, all of them, have been shown to reduce cardiac events and strokes. To my knowledge, this is the only study that ever specifically used a statin as a stroke preventive. And we did this study here at Tri-City. The study was called Sparkle. It was a trial of high-dose atorvastatin, Lipitor, before it went generic, and it was 80 milligrams, which is a high dose. No one ever looked at different doses to figure out if that high of a dose was necessary or maybe lower doses would be good enough. But what was seen, as you can see there, is the people who were on the statin compared to placebo, which was in red, had a risk reduction of uh, close to 30 percent. And each of these things that takes your risk down layers on top of the other, cutting blood pressure down, making sure that cholesterol is healthy and low. What I mean by that is if someone has had an event, cardiac event, TIA, or stroke, if the LDL is over 100, it needs to be brought down, preferably to below 70. And there isn't any proof that a very, very low level is bad. So it can be down to 20 or 30. That would seem to be OK. Sleep apnea is an under-recognized trigger and risk factor for stroke, high blood pressure, daily headaches, being sleepy during the daytime, falling asleep behind the wheel when you're driving. You know, many bad things can happen from disrupted sleep. Sleep apnea can be seen more commonly in people who are overweight, but a third of people with sleep apnea aren't overweight. Having a history of loud snoring doesn't prove sleep apnea, but it's often a signal of it. When someone's having apneic episodes, episodes where they're not breathing well, Blood pressure goes up, heart rate goes up, all of that is hard on the vasculature. And so we actually screen people who've had a stroke, do they have sleep apnea? Not that it would be the only thing that would be a risk factor, but it's an important thing for us to check into because it's treatable, right? The typical treatment is a device, continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP, but there are oral devices that move your lower jaw forward that help open up the airway. There's surgery, not very successful way of, of going about it. Important is that we look for it. The reason there's a picture of a dead rat there <laughs> isn't because atrial fibrillation kills rats, but because the previous treatment, the previous anticoagulant 
that was widely used for about 50 years was Coumadin, which is similar to a rat poison. And it entails very tight measurement of blood tests, adjustment of the medication, and a problem with Coumadin. The advantage of Coumadin is that it reduces the risk of stroke in some studies as much as 80 percent. That's brilliant. The problem is that it's what's called a vitamin K antagonist. What that means is in your diet, you're, we're all eating vitamin K, our liver needs that to make some of the clotting factors, and Coumadin, warfarin, blocks that process. So when you take a tablet, the blood level goes up, but clotting doesn't change right away. It takes several days. Therefore, if w someone needs to be anticoagulated quickly, putting them on Coumadin doesn't get them quickly anticoagulated. It's going to take about four days to do it. And if we stop it, it doesn't have its result disappear right away. Likewise, it takes days for people to rebuild the clotting factors. And if the INR, which is the measure of how anticoagulated someone is, is too high or too low and the doctor says make an adjustment, once again, it takes days and days for that adjustment to really manifest itself. So suboptimal, so the idea is that we've moved beyond rat poisons. We need better, and we now have better. There are four new medications. They're called NOAX, new oral anticoagulants or novel oral anticoagulants. And this doesn't really go into the details of each individual one. There are nuances, and if you need to be on one, cardiologists should be able to walk you through why they would favor one against another. But just in a very general sense, you can see they have a rapid onset, meaning within a few hours after taking the medication, it's working. Here, take this pill. Three or four hours later, you're anticoagulated. The results are d directly dependent upon the dose. In most cases on those meds, there's just a fixed dose. There are some um, nuances of, for example, if someone has poor kidney function, that would entail a different dosing. But there's not a blood test that could be measured. There's not a blood test that has to be monitored. They're not so easily reversible. Um, there's not a lot of drug-drug interactions, but some of them do. They have pretty short half-lives, meaning if you were to stop one of these medicines, the effect of it drops by half in about a half a day. So for example, if someone's planning on having hip surgery, they can't be anticoagulated at the time of surgery, so the medicine would be stopped. They would be put on heparin, injected anticoagulant to bridge so that they could be protected until right before the surgery. Surgery would be done. Then as soon as the surgeon felt that it was okay to be anticoagulated again, they would be restarted on the medicine and it would be rapidly effective. As far as reversal and so forth, comparing some of the medicines here, what we see is that essentially all of them are at least as good as Coumadin in terms of effectiveness in preventing stroke in the context of atrial fibrillation. They have other approvals, like if you get a blood clot in your leg and you need to be treated, these medicines are effective for that. If someone's going in for hip or knee surgery and they need to be anticoagulated preventively for a little while, these medications are approved for that. If someone has a mechanical heart valve replacement, not the right tool. They've been tested, at least one of them, Pradaxa has been tested and wasn't effective enough, so those people still need to be on Coumadin. Of these medicines, Pradaxa has a uh, reversal agent. So that what that would be useful for is suppose um, someone's in a car accident and they need emergency surgery. There's an antidote that within a couple of minutes of injection, the, rever the reversal is complete, the anticoagulant effect is abolished and they can then undergo the surgery they need, which is a lot faster than waiting two or three days, which would kind of be the standard approach if someone's on one of these medications. If someone's on Coumadin, um, that can be reversed, but the usual process of what is done in the ER isn't nearly as effective as many doctors and nurses tend to think it is, and it still takes time. So in a general sense, I would favor these over warfarin with exceptions. You can see that on the bottom lines, there's a big difference in the cost in the sense of out-of-pocket costs, but the cost of Coumadin at $4 a month doesn't really take into account the cost of failures, of monitoring, and so forth. And so ultimately, it really becomes a question of what's going to be the best for a particular person. Most people who have had a stroke don't have atrial fibrillation. That accounts for about a quarter of stroke. So most people who've had a stroke need, we call them blood thinners, but they don't change the thickness of blood, and they're not anticoagulants in the same sense that Coumadin and these other agents are, antiplatelet medicines. So the platelets are blood cells that circulate that help plug up leaks. In other words, they're part of the clotting pathway, 
And aspirin is a perfect example. If you take an aspirin, it has an antiplatelet effect for about a week because it knocks out all of the platelets that are in your bloodstream until they rebuild themselves. So theoretically, you could take an aspirin a week. Now, that wouldn't be the way to use it for protection against a heart attack or a stroke, but in fact, low-dose aspirin is effective, and I'll show you that across a whole series of studies with aspirin, the different bars show the estimated degree of benefit at doses ranging from 50 milligrams up to 18, 1,500 milligrams. In fact, the lowest dose of aspirin that's been studied is, I think, 30 milligrams was studied in Holland and was compared to 280 milligrams, which I guess is a dose that is available there. And they were effective, equally effective in a TIA treatment trial. TIA is treated with aspirin to prevent stroke. So the FDA's guidance is low-dose aspirin, 50 milligrams to 325. Over that isn't low-dose, but the key thing is higher doses are not more effective, so there's no real logic, oh, someone had a TIA on 81, take two of them, that's not going to make things better. We need to think about, first of all, what do we mean by a failure on aspirin? Since none of the medicines that I'm talking about, aspirin, clopidogrel, agronox, and so forth, are 100% effective, we're not really expecting to prevent all events. We're reducing the likelihood. Aspirin reduces the risk of stroke by about 20%. Clopidogrel, or Plavix, is approved as a stroke preventive. It was tested compared to aspirin, and they were roughly equal. Uh, clopidogrel reduced the risk of stroke by one half of 1% more than did aspirin. So that's not a home run, but it is better to that degree. The key place that I would tend to use clopidogrel is someone who can't tolerate aspirin. If someone's had a heart attack, if they've had uh, angioplasty and a stent, then typically aspirin plus Plavix are prescribed for a period of time because they work together and are more effective. The downside is there's a greater bleeding risk. So we did a couple of studies in the early 2000s that looked at aspirin plus clopidogrel compared to aspirin in one study compared to clopidogrel in another study. And while the reduced, there was a reduced risk of stroke, but a small degree, and the risk of bleeding doubled. So in general, we don't combine those two meds in stroke prevention, except for perhaps for a short period of time, maybe three months or so, because after that, the risk of bleeding continues to accrue, and the advantage has basically already been seen. So aspirin plus clopidogrel, not usually advised for stroke prevention, but aspirin or clopidogrel or Agronox, which is a combination product that is aspirin plus dipyrimidol is FDA approved and has now gone generic. When it was studied, it was compared to aspirin, and it was roughly twice as effective. So I tend to favor that, but the, the dipyrimidol portion of it can cause headache in 30 or 40 percent of people, and the medicine can provoke nausea for a week or two in about 20 or 30 percent of people, so not everyone tolerates that. Carotid endarterectomy, and there are also procedures called angioplasties and stenting, are surgical treatments to open up a blocked vessel to avoid a stroke. So in studies that have looked at that in people who have had what we would call a symptomatic narrowing, what I mean by that is a narrowing that's blocking blood flow to a substantial degree, blockage by three quarters or more, that someone has had a stroke or TIA downstream of that narrowed vessel, good surgical intervention can reduce the risk of stroke in that territory a lot. Doesn't mean you don't need the risk factor management because that doesn't Surgery doesn't affect the vessels that weren't operated on, right? Studies of treatment of asymptomatic stenosis, meaning someone's found to have a narrowing because, for example, in the church parking lot, they set up an ultrasound van and said free screenings, and then you go out worried because you were found to have a narrowed vessel. Surgery on that is much more controversial. The surgery needs to be able to be completed with a risk of 2% or less of having a stroke or dying, which means a really, really good surgeon because the hazards downstream of a vessel that hasn't caused symptoms yet aren't that high yet. And in general, good medical management is, first of all, necessary. Secondly, in most cases, probably about as effective as surgery without the risk. So we generally don't advise surgery on asymptomatic stenosis. I'm next going to kind of transition to what happens if someone has a stroke because, first of all, we can't avoid all strokes. Obviously, we want to do everything we can to keep healthy good exercise habits, not smoking, you know, all of the things that I've been talking about, but stuff still happens. So if someone has an event, remember what to do. 911, thank you. 
what happens at that point is the paramedics, the EMTs respond. They notify the radio room. We have the radio room at Tri-City that runs the, runs, if you will. Uh, the paramedic runs, ambulance runs for a large portion of North County. And they'll say, um, sounds like the patient's having a stroke. And the paramedics say, we'll be there in six minutes. They notify the neurologist. They notify the ER personnel. So we're basically ready to go when someone comes in. These are the things that the ER needs to do. Maintain an airway, make sure that there's good oxygenation. Um, don't let someone have vomiting and not clear the secretions. Make sure that blood pressure isn't too high. Get an IV going. Check the blood sugar because um, a low blood sugar can cause symptoms that look like a stroke but are basically reversed by giving glucose. So a low sugar would be a reason to be um, fixed, let's say, without a stroke. In the ER, we have guidance of what we need to do. So we need to make sure that the patient is seen rapidly by a physician. They need to have a CAT scan done quickly because we need to know that there is or is not bleeding. We have one treatment, one effective treatment for acute stroke medication. That's tissue plasminogen activator, a clot-busting medicine. And it needs to be given very quickly. So all of these um, measures are basically set up to really facilitate very, very quick treatment. Our goal, based on research studies and guidance throughout the country from the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, is we want to get people treated within 45 minutes, if possible, after they get to the door, um, certainly by an hour. And it's doable. In the big study, the NIH study that led to the approval of tissue plasminogen activator for stroke prevention, stroke treatment, Half of the people were treated within 90 minutes of the stroke occurring. That means we need timely response of whoever is in the field, 911. The paramedics need to know to take the patient to the closest appropriate facility. The ER needs to be notified so that we know someone's coming so we can prioritize and, oh, they've got a biopsy going on, the CAT scanner, we've got a stroke coming. Take the patient off the table. The biopsy is not an emergency. The stroke is an emergency. Everything is intended to try to make sure that we have the greatest chance of treating people very quickly. This data is from the NIH trial, and it basically shows that the advantage of treating with TPA, here's the line of advantage, and this is the estimate of blurriness, if you will. It really needs to be done within three hours to have the best results, and by four and a half hours, we're getting down to, it's really equivocal whether it would help. So TPA in the United States is approved for treatment within the first three hours. But in fact, based on a lot of data, European data and so forth, stroke centers routinely will treat people out to four and a half hours. There are some asterisks. So for example, studies looking at that in general didn't show very much advantage beyond age 80 if the stroke was longer. Doesn't mean we wouldn't treat, but we're going to sit down with the family and say, you know, things aren't looking so great. We're here. We're working hard to get everything done, but we're pushing the four and a half hour time window. And there may not be as much advantage opening up a blood vessel that has had blockage for a while not only has less chance of helping the injured brain, but the blood vessel itself has suffered and the risk of it bursting and having bleeding goes up as time goes by. So it really kind of pushes the let's be as timely as we can. So what has really changed is from one big study called Mr. Clean and four or five other studies um, the idea has come up that if we can open the blocked blood vessel mechanically, that's advantageous. What that entails is radiologist, interventional radiologist, bringing the patient to the cath lab, putting a catheter in from the groin, passing it all the way up past the heart, up into the brain, and snagging the clot that's blocking the blood vessel and pulling it back out. They've got a number of different uh, techniques, different kinds of fancy catheters and stents and so forth that can do this. The radiologists have been doing this for quite a while, and we've known that they could open the blood vessel, but it was only about two years ago that studies showed that opening the blood vessels actually resulted in people getting better, and that's really transformed our approach. So our approach at this point is quick as we can from the door to TPA. At the same time, we, while we're doing a CAT scan of the brain, we image the blood vessels with the CAT scanner doing a CT angiogram. That lets us see if there's a blockage of a large vessel that radiologists can open. If there's no blockage, then there's nothing for them to do. And that doesn't mean there isn't a stroke. The blood vessels that are blocked could be teeny, 
or the cloth that was there may have broken up into all of the little tributary vessels and be so small as to not be recoverable. But in a significant fraction of people, we do see that there's a blocked blood vessel. The radiologists are able to get in there, and we've seen people have you know, what we might call a Lazarus effect. You know, they have the clot removed from their brain, and they quickly wake up and say, wow, I needed that, so to speak. <laughs> They talk, which they weren't able to do before. They are able to pick up their previously paralyzed arm and have it work. So this illustrates the kind of catheter that the radiologists use. That's a cartoon of a blood vessel with a catheter in it and a mesh stent that has been passed into the clot, into the thrombus, allowed to expand, and then they'll let it sit there for a little while, and then they'll pull it back and put it out on a surgical drape. And frequently, you'll see this kind of a result on the imaging. So what we're seeing there is on the left side, you can see sort of a clipped off trunk of a tree. This is the carotid artery. This is going to the middle portion of the brain. This is going out towards the temporal and frontal lobes. And there should be a lot of branches leading up there. Here you can see that the catheter has opened that vessel. And the blood vessels beyond that are now open. So there's been restoration of blood flow and basically the opportunity to save the brain. Tri-City has been doing this for years and years. There are established criteria for basic stroke centers. Tri-City is listed as a basic stroke center because to be a comprehensive center, I think there are either two or three in San Diego County, entails having a lot more surgical procedures on ruptured vessels than we see because first of all, you can't advertise. If you have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, come here. That's an emergency. You go to the quickest appropriate place. Secondly, most subarachnoid hemorrhages, which result from a ruptured aneurysm, are not treated with open surgery. They're treated with an interventional radiology approach. So you have to have a lot of um, procedures heading your way, basically, to fit as the comprehensive center. Uh, the American Heart Association is presently looking at designating catheter-ready centers, and Tri-City has been doing it as to whether we're going to specifically go for that designation or not is still a little bit up in the air because it's asking for things that aren't truly necessary and we don't have, like having a neurointensivist in the hospital 24-7. Well, there isn't a need to have a neurointensivist in the hospital 24-7 for the occurrence of strokes that we see when our radiologists can show up and take care of things. Um, this is kind of a new and emerging idea. Since the goal for getting treatment for stroke is to be as timely as possible, in some cities in the United States on an experimental basis, and in some cities in Germany, likewise on an experimental basis, they've outfitted ambulances with CAT scanners. So this million dollar van pulls up in front of someone's home. Uh, they've called 911. They see that the hand droops, that the face is droopy. Uh, that patient looks like they might be having a stroke. They put them into the CAT scanner. If they see bleeding, as you see with that white patch in that set of images, no, no TPA for that person because TPA in a blood vessel that's already ruptured is going to be fatal. Um, scan looks okay, and there's no bleeding. They could be treated right in the van before they even get to the ER with a radio call or uh, Skype or something like that with a neurologist back at the base station at the hospital. So. Interesting approach, um, still experimental in the sense that, first of all, how many millions of uh, dollars are we going to spend on scanners? Is it going to be convenient and available to have a scanner stationed, you know, at every hospital in San Diego? There's about 25 hospitals that do TPA or at least TPA ready. So interesting, but not quite there yet. A little repetitive because this is the key feature. If you think someone's having a stroke, screen them. Remember this little simple algorithm. And if you're worried, 911, you're not bothering the paramedics. Their job is to rapidly respond, assess people, take them to the nearest stroke center, and they know what that, what that means. They're soliciting business, of course. Um, Pradaxa, like all of these blood thinners, has a known risk of bleeding. I mean, what do we expect? That's what they do. They, they anticoagulate. Um, Pradaxa is not a bad drug. It has a lower risk of bleeding than Coumadin. That makes it a good drug from my point of view. But every medicine has hazards, and in any medical circumstance, we have to balance the, the hazard against the benefit. So 
the hazard of not being on a blood thinner if you have atrial fibrillation is about a 10% annual risk of a stroke. I would much rather take the risk of being on a blood thinner and knowing that if I slip and fall, I might get injured. That's essentially what we're saying. Um, so there's not a sign that I'm aware of that would indicate that Pradaxa has greater risk. And in fact, uh, there was a large study of, oh, I forget the numbers now, about three quarters of a million people on it that showed exactly what the clinical trials showed, which was a lower risk of brain bleeding by 50% compared to Coumadin, an increased risk of GI bleeding compared to Coumadin, um, a lower risk of stroke compared to Coumadin. So to me, that's a win. If, if I'm going to have the advantage of a lower stroke risk, and if I'm trading off a risk of GI bleeding, which is not going to be fatal, against the risk of bleeding in the brain, which, by the way, we call a stroke, um, to me, that's a win, not a problem. Yeah, there have been a number of studies. First of all, the likelihood of someone having a stroke is lower if you were already on the appropriate kinds of meds. For example, a statin, diabetic control, aspirin, and so forth. Um, the consequences of the stroke are lower if you're already being treated because it's likely that the size of the stroke is going to be smaller than if you weren't having your risk factors managed. Um, if you're on aspirin, the doctors will still give TPA. It's not a reason not to be treated. Uh, is, is that basically what you were asking? Yeah. So don't stop your meds because you might have a stroke and want to be treated. Take the meds so you don't need to be treated. <laughs> no, actually, that's a designation that has just been opened up by uh, Joint Commission. And so since no one has actually finalized the rules, because they're still open for public comment, in that sense, there are no centers that would be listable as, ca as catheter ready. But um, all of the comprehensive centers, UCSD, uh, I think Mercy, um, Scripps La Jolla, and I think Alvarado, but I'm not sure, all of them are easily going to fit the uh, criteria. And there are a number of hospitals like Palomar and Tri-City that are very actively treating, with, it's called, the term is mechanical thrombectomy, and have been doing it for probably eight or more years. So our radiologists have a lot of experience, and other than whether we have a neurointervention, whether we have a critical care interventionalist um, in-house all the time or not is really the turning point of whether we would go for a designation. In other words, we're not going to stop doing the care but we may not hang a sign out that says we're catheter ready. It's not like people are going to drive past one hospital at this point to go to another, but it is true that, for example, at Scripps Encinitas, they don't do thrombectomies there. They send them all to Scripps La Jolla. So sometimes that's fine. Sometimes traffic is very bad and they have to land a helicopter and fly people place to place. The advantage of that is the neurointerventionalists are maintaining their skills, um, it also keeps the numbers up at Scripps La Jolla so they can maintain their certification as a comprehensive center. So it's important to get people to the right level of care. Comprehensive centers are the ones that are um, doing a, a sufficient number, of basically, of neurosurgical procedures. That's really what it boils down to because the hospitals that are currently listed as basic, Tri-City is a good example, we're giving TPA in probably close to 30% of all strokes. That's very good. If you look nationwide, 3% of ischemic stroke is treated with TPA. So we're doing a, a very good job, very aggressively treating people appropriately, um, but we wouldn't fit the criteria for comprehensive center. We looked at that, and essentially it would be dependent upon having enough aneurysms rupture within a particular year or two that came there, and that's something we have no control over. Plus, I don't want to see people with ruptured aneurysms. They're really sick. About a third of them don't live long enough to get to the ER. I'm not sure I've heard the term, but in my mind that would mean that someone had, um, let's say, multiple, and so that could happen, multiple emboli would be a pretty good example where if someone has atrial fibrillation, the scan may show a stroke over here, a stroke over here, a stroke back here, because blood flow goes wherever it goes. Another, let's say, description might be 
if someone has a clot, a thrombus that blocks one blood vessel and then it fragments and the little pieces go downstream, then that could be multiple emboli in the same vascular distribution. When we see people who have emboli in multiple vascular distributions, that always makes us worry about the heart or the aorta as a source because if someone has a carotid narrowing, for example, they may have more than one stroke occur downstream of that vessel, but they're not going to have anything happen on the other side of the brain unless there's something else going on. There is data that shows that depending on how badly the vessels are blocked and how much calcification has happened, if it's all calci calcified, um, first of all, that's not as dangerous. Secondly, there's no medication that's going to remove that. If it's soft, soft kind of buildup of atherosclerosis, um, aggressive risk factor treatment has been shown to, to improve it. In other words, with ultrasound, we can measure how thick the lining of the blood vessel has gotten, and with good control of cholesterol, blood pressure, and so forth, that thickening can go back towards normal. So that's what we mean by aggressive risk factor modification, is treating all of the things that I mentioned. Um, if it's really bad and symptoms are occurring, then depending on what blood vessel and where it is, surgery may be an option. Well, they can't yet give TPA because at the time that they're in the van, we don't know that they aren't having bleeding in the brain. But they will do an EKG and transmit that back to the ER so we know what's going on in terms of heart rhythm or, for that matter, maybe the pa patient's having a heart attack at the same time. They'll put IV lines in so when the patient gets to the ER, we can give fluids, we can give medications. They'll give oxygen if necessary. They'll keep the head of the uh, gurney up a bit because that can reduce the risk if someone vomits of it ending up in their lungs and having aspiration pneumonia. They want to do their best to get a careful history of when symptoms started. That's crucial when we see the patient in the ER because that time from onset to treatment depends on what information you get about the onset. A good example would be uh, someone who wakes up at 7 in the morning and their speech is garbled and their arm is weak uh, and they went to bed at 11. Well, we have to go with our last known well, which means when they went to bed at 11, they were fine. Or suppose they got up at 6 a.m. and they were fine and they said something to their wife and, you know, went and used the toilet and everything was good. And then an hour later, they wake up and their speech is garbled and they're uh, not doing well. Okay, we now have a different time of last known well. We can't know if someone was asleep when it started, exactly when it started, but we start the timer as when they were last good. So the paramedics are, are instructed to get as much detail um, to interview whoever was there because if the person themselves is garbled, they may not be able to articulate. And then often to bring that uh, reporter, the person who saw things or knows things along with us, with them. So when the neurologist and the ER doctor are trying to piece things together, it's not a matter of, oh, um, we don't know where they are. They must be driving here losing our, uh, our option of getting correct, quick information because we want to start things up as quickly as we can. But they, can't, they can treat very high blood pressure to a degree with um, instructions from the ER, uh, but they can't start people on TPA in the ERs, in the vans. So the cardiologist was right, seven days. So with Pradaxa, um, the, full of the anticoagulant effect has worn off after three days. So the risk, the surgical risk of bleeding is going to be back to that of not being on Pradaxa. Um, if it was an emergency, they would say, oh, this person just came in uh, in an ambulance, they were in a car wreck, and they need an emergency operation on their spleen. They can give an antibody that reverses the effect of Pradaxa in three minutes, and they can take the person to the operating room. The, the tension there is obviously the surgeon doesn't want bleeding when they're operating. The cardiologist doesn't want a stroke, nor do you. So they want the person to be exposed to that risk from not being anticoagulated for as short a period as possible. 
And if it's a planned operation, then what they would probably do is stop Pradaxa, start heparin, which is an injectable blood thinner, continue that till maybe 12 hours before surgery, and then when that stopped, its effect wears right off. Therefore, the risk exposure of not being anticoagulated has been minimized. Most people with migraine don't have neurologic symptoms other than a sickening, throbbing, sensitizing headache. But about 20% of people with migraine get aura. So aura is neurologic symptoms that can be stroke-like. The most common aura is visual. And the most typical description would be someone says, I get like a blurry spot and zigzags and sparkles, starts in one part of vision, and then it tends to spread and then may disappear over 30 or 40 minutes. Aura can include tingling and numbness. It also tends to start in one area and spread gradually. It can include trouble with speech, weakness and heaviness, all of which look very stroke-like. So a couple of things that help us discern them. First of all, stroke typically is abrupt, and as is TIA. So if someone's having stroke-related trouble in vision, they typically say, oh, uh, my vision just went out in my eye, or half of my vision went out, or, oh, my arm just went numb, all of it at once. Whereas migraine, the physiology, is very different. It's an electrical disturbance in the brain. And that spreads over the surface of the brain at two or three millimeters a minute. So the symptoms, likewise, creep. If someone's having numbness, it would typically start in the hand and spread up. Then it might go to the face. Or I saw someone earlier today who's been getting episodes where she gets tingling in the top of her head. And then it goes down to here. And then it spreads down her arm. Not very stroke-like, but. It got very severe back in February. She went to the ER. She had a full workup, including looking at the vessels, MRI, and so forth. And all of her lab work, all of her vasculature was fine. And it turns out they didn't really take her headache history, which was she started having migraine headaches with visual aura when she was 27, when she was pregnant. They happen four or five times a year. They've mostly died off in the last five years. She still gets some headaches that are migraine without aura, and she gets these episodes of aura without headache. So it can be complicated, and it also kind of depends on the circumstance. In other words, if there's someone who has aura-like features that's never had a headache, and they come in and they're 70 years old, and they're saying, my vision's getting weird and sparkly, and my hand then gets tingly and numb, I'm going to work it up as if it's a stroke or TIA, because that's the more worrisome scenario. On the other hand, once I've worked it up and I've reassured myself that it's not a vascular problem, it's a migraine-related problem, I'm going to reassure the person, this is unpleasant, it's annoying, but it's not s specifically dangerous. If you're talking about across the population, no. It's roughly equal right and left brain. Um, Two-thirds or more of strokes are within the anterior circulation. That's the portion of the brain that's fed by the carotid arteries. The other portion are from the vertebral arteries. They go up across the back of the neck, and the symptoms of posterior circulation stroke tend to be rather different. Double vision, trouble swallowing, dizziness, because the portions of the brain that those blood vessels go to are not the portions that would cause aphasia, a language impairment. Not specifically. I mean, any diet that's too rigid is too rigid. Right? I mean, <laughs> moderation in all things, including moderation. Um, it used to be thought that eggs were really bad for us. It turns out, well, they're a good source of protein. Cholesterol in our bloodstream is not specifically from eating fatty things. So it depends. You know, if you eat six eggs a day, mm, you're going to gain weight, and that's probably not an ideal thing because weight gain alone is, is not a wonderful thing. But they're a good source of protein. They're, a, let's say, a balanced meal in a sense. I think a greater risk, I read a nice article forget where, yesterday online, about cereals and the fact that, you know, cereals that you walk down the aisle and say, oh, we're going to get the whatever, are a terrible way of starting the day. They push your blood sugar up, right? Um, they increase the risk of getting overweight. They are sugar and not e even the ones that are not sugar are all very processed grains. So they're not the kind of food that you should be starting a day with when you've been fasting overnight. So I personally would stay away from, you know, packaged cereals, at least the usual ones, and an egg periodically, or if that's a big part of your diet, 
daily probably isn't a big deal. But, you know, talk to your doctor about what your risk factors are, how your blood pressure, cholesterol, blood sugar look, and those are things that everyone should know or ask their doctors and make sure that you're aware of. Aspirin a day, low-dose aspirin, 81 milligrams, um, is generally advised for men over 50 for heart attack protection. And data shows that in women, it reduces stroke risk. So it's not a bad thing to be on low-dose aspirin. Omega-3, et cetera, can be helpful in terms of balancing out your cholesterol in your body. So that's potentially advisable, but it depends on whether it's a problem for you or not. Supplements in the sense of multivitamins, the big studies of that have shown essentially no health benefit. So I don't take them. You know, if someone brings me five jars of things and say, what do you think? I say, well, first of all, I don't even know what 10 of those 30 things on each bottle are. Um, secondly, I don't know that that which it says it has, that it has, because the supplements are not regulated at all by the FDA. So unlike, if you go to Costco and get aspirin, it's aspirin. If you go to Whole Foods or somewhere and get a supplement, there's no one that certifies that in a regulatory sense. And there have been some supplements that were laced with arsenic or, you know, nasty things, you know, Chinese herbs. Well, I don't know what's in them, and neither do you. You're taking it on faith, and you're not taking it on the basis of any lab that has verified that it has what it, ha what it states to have. So given the lack of knowledge of what it has in it, the lack of evidence that it does anything useful, I don't generally recommend a multivitamin. Not inherently, but it may indicate that you've got a cardiac conduction problem. PVCs, premature ventricular contractions, are bump, you feel your heart skip for a beat or something like that. Um, but what's really important is to know whether that's all that's happening or whether someone might be having short runs of atrial fibrillation because AFib isn't always continuous. It may just come and go. So if it's a frequent thing, person ought to see a cardiologist and get monitored and find out what the real picture is. And if all that's happening is PVCs, it's annoying but probably not particularly dangerous. That's a terrific idea. Um, for those of you that have smartphones, you know, put the same sort of information on your phone. Uh, it's very common for me to have patients come to see me and they don't know what half of the medicines that there are on or what they're for. And that means, number one, you know, the patient and the doctor haven't really had a useful conversation. The reason you're taking such and such is, and oftentimes people end up on medicines that are um, a little bit repetitive, may have been smart to be on at one point and may not need to stay on it. And so I think having a good list of what you take, your vital signs, um, your allergies is crucial. Um, yeah, of course. Um, you know, genes aren't destiny, but if, you know, multiple family members had heart attacks and strokes at young age, mm, you got some genes that we may not understand specifically which ones are problematic, but that indicates that you're at greater risk. Um, unfortunately, at this point, that doesn't mean we can change your genetics, but it certainly would, to me, say that person needs to be even more attentive to all of the risk factors that we talked about that we can do something about. Um, age is a risk factor for stroke, and as I look around, you know, some of us are older and some of us are younger. Old is good. That means you're gotten there, uh, <laughs> right? That's not a modifiable risk factor. That's a, it's just a good thing. And it beats the alternative. <laughs> Thanks very much.